Okay, uh, good evening everybody. Uh, today we are uh, starting our second day of PMP training. Yesterday we covered some of the details about the PMP certification. How can you apply for that? What are the requirements? And what is the whole procedure about it? So we did talk about that. But today we will continue with a little more on the same line. And that is how you will be able to schedule your exam. And then we will get into the PMBOK and we will move on to the very first chapter of PMBOK that is the introduction. Anyways, as far as the PMP exam scheduling is concerned, the first thing you need to know is how much do you have to pay? I think most of you already know it. The fee for PMP exam for a non-member is $555. Okay. Just hold on a minute. Okay. Tell me if you can see the slide. Do you see the PMP exam fee? Okay, right here. Okay. For PMP exam, you have to pay, if you are a non-member, $555. But naturally, there is no fun going for this certification if you are not a member because then you cannot enjoy the benefits of being a member. I'll talk about the benefits of membership. But if you are a member, the first benefit for you here is that the exam fee of PMP will be reduced to $405. Although the rest of the money they will get in shape of membership, but then that is worth it. So you will have to pay for your yearly subscription to BMI $129 plus $10 for the first time registration. That makes it $139. And I will very strongly recommend that you join the local PMI chapter wherever you are. So if you are in Dubai or in Pakistan, Lahore, Islamabad, wherever, uh, there is a chapter in Karachi, in Lahore and Islamabad and actually in Dubai also. So whatever chapter is nearest to you, you must opt for that and seek membership of that chapter also and that you don't have to do it by physically going to that chapter, you can join it right here when you apply for PMP exam and PM, PMI membership. When you apply for PMI membership, it gives you an option to join any chapters you feel like. You can join one or more than one chapters. So if you join Islamabad chapter, that will cost you $15 additional per year. For Karachi chapter, it is $20 per year. For Lahore chapter, they don't charge. I think um, I think they have started charging, but uh, I'm not really sure what their fee is. But so if at all you pay for your chapter and your PMI dues, it will not be more than $150. So that means within $555, you are not only a member of PMI, but also member of the local chapter and your fee, exam fee is also catered for. Okay, then these are the computer based testing. If at all, some someone is appearing for paper based testing, but that is not for you. Paper based testing is done in those countries where there is no computer based testing available. And computer-based testing with PMI is associated with Sylvan Prometric Testing Centers, which we have in Dubai, in Karachi, in Lahore, in Islamabad, everywhere, almost everywhere, you will have a Sylvan Prometric Center. But like countries like Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, they don't have. So if at all they allow, then the paper-based testing can be held there. And the fee for paper-based testing is less. But naturally, you, it is not for you. So you must be focusing only on the $405 plus membership. 
if at all by some poor chance you do not qualify in the very first attempt in that case you can appear again and reappearing in the exam would cost you $275 as a member and if you are not a member it is $375 then after you know you can do three attempts in one year every time you have to pay $275 as a member but third time if you fail then you are banned for one year from appearing in PMP exam and uh, once your application for PMP is accepted you are given one year and during this one year you have got these three chances so it is up to you you want to avail only one chance and uh, pass in the very first opportunity that is very good and naturally I will desire that that each one of you should be clearing the exam in the very first attempt but at the same time um, you should always cater for some extra time in case you do not make it in the first attempt so um, if I were at your place I would plan for first six months to appear in the exam for the very first time and in case I do not make it I will schedule my next attempt after three months and if still I can't make it then I am still left with three months so I can very conveniently have my three attempts but again I am saying I am not asking you to do that I mean I hope and wish you appear in the very first time and pass but uh, for your own protection you must uh, you must cater for the three chances once you have qualified PMP exam as I told yesterday you have to gather 60 professional development units in every three year cycle and if you have done that you can renew your PMP status if you are a member you pay $60 and renew it if you are not a member you pay $150 and renew it so that is as far as the PMP exam fee is concerned okay if you can see the next slide you can see a web address there www.prometric.com slash PMI you can go to this website this website will get you to a page on Prometric's website there it is specifically made for the PMI and you have to give the login and password which you will be provided when your application is accepted so that login would be your PMI eligibility ID PMI eligibility ID will be provided to you when PMI will accept your application that will also show you the start and end date of your eligibility the whole one year period and uh, generally the password is the first four characters of your name so you enter and log in uh, on the Prometric website and you can select your own choice of time and date for your exam so there is no fixed date you can choose your own date you can sit in the exam whenever you feel like but provided there is a, a seat available you have to book it beforehand a little protection on your side a warning from Prometric they say if you want to get a specific date for your exam try to book it at least six weeks before that date that will give you extra protection if the center is busy if there are no seats available you would know beforehand so this is very safe if you can book your exam six weeks early 
So if at all you are planning to appear in the exam say within next three months then all the process of applying for the exam, getting your audit and everything completed, submitting your fee, your audit and everything completed, that will take some time. And then your eligibility period will start. So all this process should, if you, if you start filling your application today, this will take about four to five weeks or maybe six weeks. And as soon as you get a go ahead from PMI, you should go to the, this website promatic.com slash PMI and book your exam. So you don't have enough time. You just can't relax and say, well, I'll do it later. Because if you keep doing it later, you procrastinate, then probably you will not be appearing within the next three months. You will be stretching it to next six months. But anyways, I, that is not my problem. Whether you appear in three months or six months or even in one month, that is your plan, that is your scheduling, how you go about it. But another uh, warning here is, be mindful of the end date of your eligibility. Because if you stretch your first attempt to the end of the eligibility period, that means one year which has been allowed to you, you may not get a seat in the exam. And thus your chance, the whole one year opportunity would be extinguished. That we don't want to do. So Promatic advises you that at least three months before your expiration date of your eligibility period, you must book your exam. So these are two uh, very good instructions for booking your exam and you must work accordingly. Now cancellation policy. PMI's cancellation policy about PMP exam is that if you change the date of your exam at least 30 days before the date you have fixed one attempt to change the exam would be free. Say you have booked your exam six weeks earlier than the date and within the first two weeks you realize that probably that is not a suitable date and you want to change it. Then before you enter the last 30 days, you can change the date without incurring any cost. But if you are within the last 30 days, you have to pay $70. You have to pay $70 for change of date of the exam, provided you do have eligibility time left with you. In the last two days of the exam, you have absolutely no power to change your exam. And if you try to do that, you have to repay the whole fee. Your previous fee, which you had submitted earlier, would be forfeited completely. So be mindful of this, that you do not change on, you know, sudden impulses. Do not change the dates. Be very thoughtful, uh, plan well, and only then take your date. Now, sometimes when you book your exam, you may come across certain emergencies due to which you cannot reach the exam center, you meet an accident or something bad happens and you can't sit in the exam. What about that? Will PMI allow you something? Yes, of course. But the policy of PMI is that only in these cases listed here, you could be allowed another chance. Number one, if there is a medical emergency. If you are a soldier, if you are deployed by your forces that could be one of the reasons that you cannot come to the exam. There is a death in the immediate family. There is an illness in the immediate family or there is a natural disaster. These are the only five cases when P 
PMI may consider that you should be provided another chance. But again, you must intimate PMI about your emergency within 72 hours, within 72 hours of your exam time. If you don't do that, you don't stand any chance to be provided another opportunity to sit in the exam. I hope you understand these points. Is yeah, everybody with me? If you have any doubts, anything, please do let me know. Right. So this was about the exam. Now entering into the exam, when you are going to the exam center, what is the identification which is acceptable by BMI? Are your exam center you see if you have a valid driver's license but be mindful of the fact that this license must be in English or whatever identification you bring in that must be in English so a valid driver's license is a valid ID if you are a soldier or you are serving in military or any such organization your identity card would also serve. Military identity will also serve the purpose. Your valid passport, uh, be, uh, uh, focus on this point that everything you produce in front of them must be a valid document. Valid means it should not be expired. Your driver license, if it is expired, they will not entertain it. So your passport, a valid passport and a valid NIC national identity card so these are the four basic identifications which will be entertained in the exam center and we recommend that you take along at, at least three different identifications with you and out of those three identifications at least one should have a photo identity on it in addition to these what else can be accepted there as an identity if you have got a ID card from your employer that could also be entertained if you have got a credit card or a debit card with your signature that could also be accommodated what cannot be accommodated is a social security card or a library card so I think you should be very clear about what kinds of identifications you must take along because in the exam center uh, you just can't argue they will just get you out of the exam center they will not let you enter in your exam and uh, uh, then you won't be able to uh, you know sit in the exam then once you enter into the exam uh, hall you may be provided may be provided with a calculator if they don't provide you a calculator then a cal calculator would be provided on on screen uh, within the exam which is normally the case normally they do not provide you a separate calculator but if at all they do they, that is possibility but you can't bring take along anything with you no pen no pencil no calculator no foot ruler nothing at all you can't take along even a handkerchief you will be strip searched and you absolutely cannot take long anything in the exam center they will provide you some pencils and scrap paper for your rough work which you will have to resubmit back after your exam is over so the test center has its own rules they will give you a sheet like this which is written in front of you uh, it may be similar maybe you know uh, a bit different but those instructions you you will be made to read before you enter into the exam center uh, naturally um, there are a lot many things written here which uh, you already may be aware of there is no eating and drinking there there is no argument there is no disturbance you can't speak loud or tap on the table and things like that so you can read through these instructions and these, these are the instructions for um, when you are sitting in the exam 
because this exam is four hours long, there are certain other things you must consider. For example, this exam of four hours, you will have 200 questions. Four hours means about 240 minutes. That comes out to be about 72 seconds per question. That is not a huge time. It's not enough time. Although there are questions which are very simple, you can do them in seconds, but at the same time there will be, will be questions which are a bit tricky. So they will take a little more. So you have to keep an average speed of 72 seconds per question. if you want to attempt all the 200 questions. And this is difficult because when you start attempting these questions, every minute you will be posed a different question. And you have to reorient your mind towards that and answer that. So you will burn out after two to three hours. So it is necessary that you must take some break. Although there is no break allowed in the exam, the exam time will go on, but at the same time, no, uh, nobody stops you from getting up and getting out of the exam center to flex your muscles, maybe go to washroom, have a drink of water, but you must do all this within a couple of minutes, one or two minutes, three minutes most. You must get back to your exam because your clock is running. So, I will very strongly recommend that after you have gone through two hours of exam, you must have one break. If you don't do that, trust me, you will not be able to understand anything what is written on the, on the screen. The words will start, start jumping around. It is physically and mentally very, very tiring. Therefore, you must have a little relaxation, go out and flex your muscles, especially that is, that is very important. So this will give you a bit of life and you can move on for yet another hour. And I would say, take another break after another hour. That way, you will be able to survive four hours. And in the exam, naturally, there are so many questions and uh, if you don't understand a question, if you're stuck in a question, there is a normal tendency that you keep reading that question, keep struggling with it and you waste a lot of time. Maybe sometimes five to 10 minutes you waste on a single question, which will delay the time of all your other questions which are left and ultimately you won't be able to catch up. Therefore, I will suggest that you do not stop anywhere. Start attempting the questions wherever you feel you are about to be stuck. You don't understand this question. Leave that question. Move forward. Go to the next question. And in the first go, quickly attempt as many questions as you can. And once you have done the first cycle, you, if you are well prepared, you should be able to respond to at least 70% of questions. And trust me, these 70% questions you have attempted from the first go, they will not be wrong. Because you are well, well prepared. And if you are well prepared, then you are absolutely not going to do these questions wrong. So approximately 70% marks are around that you have already got. Now, by this, uh, uh, by the, by the uh, uh, first round, you would have spent about two to three hours. Now you can go back to those questions you have not attempted or you have missed out. And now you can give them a little more time and think about them. But again, do not get stuck on any one question. And respond those questions to the best of your knowledge. But you see, sometimes um, if you are not sure about an answer, it seems that the four options offered to you, at least two look very similar. 
and you think that one of them if are both of them are right if that be the case and that will be the case sometimes both are for all four of the answers are right but then as i said earlier you have to choose the best one so choose the best answer and if you can't if you completely do not understand what um, anything about the question and the, and the answer options offered to you in that case you must do the process of elimination you eliminate the one answer which is most inappropriate then you are left with three choices then eliminate another then yet another the only one left would be your choice but please do not select answers randomly read them through carefully and this should be an intentional decision which choice you are making anyways even in this second cycle you could leave out one odd question but then you can turn back and fix that and that is if you are well managing your time within 4 hours you will be able to attempt all the 200 questions and again if you are well prepared you will pass as far as the pass score is concerned pmi does not tell you what is the pass score because it's not a percentage it is a percentile and percentile means if it is 90 percentile that would mean all those people who are appearing in the exam top 10% of them would be selected and they would be declared pass so you don't know what is the percentile on which people are passing that specific day it could be 60% percentile it could be 90 percentile it could be anything but this you must be sh sure of that they are picking the top cream so if you want to be in the top top few you must be preparing for at least scoring 85 to 90 percent marks this should be the standard of your preparations although i'm not making you afraid of all that process but this is something to be taken seriously you just can't <clears throat> take it so lightly and you can sit in the exam and pass this is not just like that you have to prepare for it thoroughly don't do not take it lightly and then you have to you know once somebody clears the exam after you know when you have done the exam your result will be shown to you and you will be given um, a paper sign uh, with your result on it that that is really a great achievement if somebody passes the exam that is a eureka even for you so you must avail that that moment and you must aim for passing the exam in the first attempt now let us assume that you have passed the exam then how are you going to get those 60 professional development units okay before i can move ahead with that if anyone has any question till now please speak up none okay uh, rijo you are you are late a bit today again a bad connection we can't hear you anyways no problem okay let me move on the 60 pd you think how do you do that this is called ccr cycle the three year cycle uh, in which you can upkeep your pmp from the date you have been certified you have passed the exam three years from from that date is the time of your pmp if you have passed the exam on 15th of september then three years later on 14th of september your certification will expire 
and your next cycle will start on 15th. So that means you must have acquired your 60 professional development units before the 14th of September. And you must have also paid for that. I know of a case, a person who, who had all the 60 PDUs, but he did not renew his PMP status and it was cancelled. He just had to pay $60 and he ignored it. So it, it is not just an automatic process that you have completed your 60 PDUs and you will be upgraded. No, you have to pay $60 as well if you are a member and $150 if you are not a member. <clears throat> this is how your CCR cycle will look like. Your exam date when you pass the exam, your three years start, one year, two year and three year. By the end of three year, you should have, you should have gained 60 professional development units and you should have paid a renewal fee of $60. If you don't do that, your PMP status will be suspended for one year. And during that one year, you will be provided an opportunity to complete that requirement of 60 PDUs and paying $60. If in this period you do that, your CCR cycle will start from the point the previous CCR cycle had ended. It will not start from the point you have paid your subscription or renewal fee. You may have paid your renewal fee by the end of suspension period, but it will start from the beginning of the year. And then that would be three years again given to you. And you can, after every three years, you can keep renewing your CCR cycle and your PMP status will be automatically renewed every three years. <clears throat> there are various certifications by PMI, like, you know, in uh, addition to PMP, we have got Program Management Professional, we have got Portfolio Management Professional, we have got Agile Certified Professional, Scheduling Professional, Risk Management Professional, and uh, Professional in Business Analysis, and CAPM. Every certification has its own requirements of PDUs. As far as the PMP, PGMP, and PFMP, that is Project, Program, and Portfolio Management Professional exams are concerned, they all have a requirement of 60 PDUs each. 60 PDUs each for each one of these certifications. For every three years, you have to gain 60 PDUs in each category. For scheduling professional and risk management professional, you have to gain 30 PDUs in three years, but that those 30 PDUs must be in the specialized area of the certification you have done. Like for scheduling professional, you have to have these 30 PDUs in scheduling. For risk management professional, it has to be in project risk management. Similarly, if it is a PBA, professional in business analysis, then again the requirement is 60 PDUs in the area of business analysis. For ACP, ACP is Agile Certified Professional. There are again 30 PDUs in Agile practices. CAPM is one certification which cannot be renewed. And this is different in a way that all other certifications have a CCR period of three years, but CAPM stands good for five years, but it is non-renewable. You cannot renew CAPM. If you want to have CAPM status updated, you have to appear in the exam again. You have to apply from a issue. But who should apply for CAPM again? Probably nobody. Because once you have got five years of experience in project management, you are already completing the requirements for PMP. Why not PMP? Then go for PMP. Right. 
So if this much is clear, let us discuss what if you acquire more than required number of PDUs. If you require 60 PDUs in 3 years and you have acquired say 80 PDUs or 90 PDUs or 100 PDUs, what about those extra PDUs you have, you have acquired? Uh, will they be carried forward? Okay. There is a limit for carrying forward the PDUs. In case of PNP, PGMP, PFMP and PBA, you can only carry forward 20 PDUs in each area. For RMP, SP and ACP, you can only carry forward 10 PDUs. It means that if I have gained 100 PDUs, 60 PDUs will be counted towards my CCR cycle in case of PMP and 20 PDUs can be carried forward to the next cycle. So the next three years I would then have to only gain 40 more PDUs to fulfill the next requirement. But there is a catch. If you want to carry forward your PDUs to the next CCR cycle, then the condition is that those 20 PDUs which you want to carry forward must have been achieved in the last year of the CCR cycle. Hope I am not confusing you. You have gained 60 PDUs in the very first year, 20 PDUs in the second year and 20 PDUs in the third year. Right? So, 60 PDUs will be counted towards your current CCR cycle and the 20 PDUs which you gained in the last year will be carried forward. The rest 20 PDUs will be wasted. Okay, let's look at another scenario. You gained 60 PDUs in first cycle, uh, first, first year, 40 PDUs in the second year and none in the third year. Can anyone tell me how many will be carried forward? There is one. Here is one. None. Okay. Very good. So, 60 PDUs you gained in the very first year will be counted towards your requirement. The 40 PDUs you gained in the second year are of no use because they cannot be carried forward. Third year, you have none. So nothing will be carried forward. So if everybody is clear about it, well and good, we can move ahead. Okay, these PDUs you gain, they are actually from two different categories. One are called educational PDUs and the other are called giving back to the profession PDUs. Now educational PDUs is what you learn, what you learn the fresh knowledge about project management, that is your educational PDUs. So if you attend classes, seminars or things like that, they will add to your educational PDUs. Maybe after doing your PMP certification, you get admission in a master's class and you study project management as a subject. So the credit hours you gain from there would be translated into the educational PDUs. If you attend a seminar or a workshop on project management, you will get some PDUs from there. So there is no restriction on educational PDUs. You can gain as many as you want. All the 60 PDUs you can get from educational side, that is okay. But there is a limitation. Don't go in this slide because the figures written here uh, are no more valid. Let me move on to the next slides and that will be clarified. They have updated the CCR program in 2015, 1st December 2015. And according to the new framework, 60% of the PDUs as compared to 15% earlier are now required 
in this category. In the education, you must gain at least 60% PDU. Let me move on to, yeah, okay. So 60% of PDUs, I'll show you how. Educational PDUs are now aligned with a new concept which is called PMI Talent Triangle. It is not like earlier that you just keep getting some education on project management and you, you can claim the PDUs, but they have to be in three different categories. And they are represented as Talent Triangle. A minimum number of PDUs must be earned in technical project management, leadership and strategic and business management category. These are the three vertices of the talent triangle, technical project management, leadership and the third vertice is strategic and business management. The maximum number of total PDUs to be earned in this category has decreased. That is the giving back to the society. How do you give back to the society? You teach someone, you uh, gain some practical experience, you do practice in your profession, you do some research, you write some research papers, you write some articles or books. So all of these things are giving back to the society or the profession. So even if you are volunteering for PMI or for any organization where some projects are being run, you are volunteering for that, you will get some PDUs for that. If you are creating new knowledge, you are writing a book or article or something, that is also giving back to the profession. Or if you are working as a professional, you are increasing your experience, that would also give you some PDUs. So these are the three sides of the PMI talent triangle. Technical project management means that it contains all the knowledge of project management and all the other technical details about it. Leadership is a soft skill. It includes conflict management, negotiations, leadership and all those topics, you know, which a project manager should have. Then. The strategic and business management is a new word is added to this and this means that you must have a thorough knowledge of the organizational strategy and the business mechanism in your organization as if you can properly align your projects with the business strategy. So this method, this new method, this new technique of PMI train triangle have will be able to give you greater competitive advantage, higher credibility and more direction for your career development. So what all is included? In technical project management, the knowledge, skills and behaviors related to specific domains of project program and portfolio. Leadership, knowledge, skills and behaviors specific to leadership oriented cross cutting skills that help an organization achieve its business goals. And business and strategic, this is the knowledge of and expertise in the industry or organization that enhances performance and better delivers business outcomes. If you want to see a list of that, under the strategy in business management, you can see a complete list of the things. And here is the slide. Benefits management and realization, business acumen, business models and structure, competitive analysis. These are all are the strategic and business management topic which a project manager must know and if you do some training in that in these areas that would be counted towards strategic and business management if you do some training in a technical area of the project management which include agile practices data gathering and modeling earned value management project program and portfolio governance life cycle management and so on and so forth this all is the technical area of the project management and you know, there are certain requirements to have skills in this also. Leadership, we have brainstorming, coaching, mentoring, counseling, conflict management, emotional intelligence, 
and any training on these areas would count towards leadership. Now, if we are clear about this, we will see how these 60 PTUs are distributed. For PMP, PGMP, PFMP and PMI, PBA, all four of these certifications have 60 PTUs. Just look at it. Under the education, under the education, you can see three different colors. Blue color stands for technical and you have to gain at least eight PDUs in technical category. Green is leadership. You have to gain eight PDUs in this category. And then purple is the strategic and business management. You have to gain eight PDUs in this category. So these are the compulsory divisions, eight each. So these are 24 PDUs you must get from these three areas, right? Okay, how many PDUs at the minimum you require in education? You need 60% of the total. That comes out to be 35 PDUs. How many are compulsory? Eight in technical, eight in leadership and eight in strategic and business management, 24. How many are left? These are 11 PDUs which are left. Now, these 11 PDUs you can gain from any of these three areas. They either could be from technical, leadership or strategic, but these areas, these could be from any of these areas. So the minimum requirement for education is to have 35 PDUs from education side. You'd learn at least 35 PDUs every three years. And what is the upper limit? There is no upper limit. All the 60 PDUs you can gain from education. You may not have any PDUs from the giving back category. All the PDUs, 60 PDUs, you could get from education. But if you have got all the 60 PDUs in the technical category, Will it suffice the purpose? Anyone? Jijnab. No, sir. You have to have at least eight in technical, eight in leadership, and eight in strategic and business management. So these 24 are compulsorily to be eight each. Remaining, you can have all, uh, all remaining videos maybe from education. Our minimum of 35 PDUs are to be from the education. We are left with how many? We are left with 25. If we gain only 35 PDUs in education, we are left with 25 PDUs. Now, what about these 25 PDUs? The, there is only one restriction here. You cannot have more than eight PDUs gained from your experience in three years. Working experience of three years will give you maximum of eight PDUs. So out of 25, eight PDUs means you are still left with 17 to fulfill. Those 17 PDUs you could acquire either from volunteering or, or from creating knowledge. Either or both of them. <clears throat> so this is how you can complete your 25 PDUs. I hope this is clear to everybody. Hello. Did you? Yeah, uh, sir, I'm not sure if I missed out. Uh, could you explain what does volunteering mean? Vo volunteering means um, you have to do some volunteer work on some kind of projects. You know, volunteering means that you do not get paid for doing that work. It is not, you know, you are employed in an NGO, you are not volunteering actually. You are actually getting paid out of it. So that is not a volunteer work. So it could be for any cause, it could be for PMI itself, it could be any other organization where you are working as a volunteer, 
but that work should be project related. That will give you the uh, necessary PDUs. If you are volunteering with PMI, there are many options. Number one, you can volunteer with your local chapter. So organizing events and things like that, you can work with them and they will give you certain PDUs. You can even stand in elections and get elected in the local chapter and serve there as a volunteer. You can even apply to PMI to work globally as a volunteer with PMI. Like you see, <clears throat> these st uh, standards, the PMBOK and other standards created by PMI, they are actually developed by volunteers. I have been working with them. We never got paid. But yes, we worked on those standards and we did get the PDUs out of them. So there are many opportunities in PMI where you can contribute and you can get some PDUs from there. But the easiest way is that you can get from your local chapter. If it, and it is not necessary that you get these PDUs from PMI. I have also been a member of other organizations, volunteer organizations like Toastmasters, uh, Toastmasters International, and I have <clears throat> served as president there. <clears throat> so I did uh, get some PDUs from that work also. So is it clear what PDUs are? Uh, volunteering, uh, volunteering means. G. Hello. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, for the uh, for PMP certification and for the program management, you said uh, sixty PDUs each. Yeah. So, uh, can there be you know like educational hours that can be shared? Yeah. Or is it that I have to do separate courses? No. I mean, or these training hours separately? Actually, uh, PMP, PGMP, and PFMP, all three are once you do them. You, you qualify all three of them, your PDUs are united. You just get 60 PDUs and they will be counted towards each. Right? So you, as a PMP, PGMP and PFMP, I get only 60 PDUs and they, count, they are counted towards all. But for PBA, they will be different PDUs. For RMP, there will be different PDUs. For SP, there will be different PDUs. There could be, you know, kind of, uh, um, you know, I attend a course which is partially schedule management, partially risk management, also deals with the overall project management. So I may claim some PDUs on the scheduling side, some PDUs on the risk management side, and all of the PDUs on the PMP side. You got it? All right, understood, sir. Okay. So similarly, as we discussed for the PMP, uh, we have got the similar mechanism for other certifications. Uh, these slides are not important. These are old ones. Okay. Uh, so for other certifications also, you can get a similar kind of a map, which I just discussed with you. So this is how you can get your uh, PDUs after you have qualified your exam. So this much is for the PDUs and all that. So any questions, anything you want to discuss? Actually, I don't see much of interaction. Sir, uh, sorry, it, it's not about this uh, uh, discussion. I just wanted to ask, the link you shared, it's not working, like uh, for the PMBOK and the other uh, the slides? Uh, it's not working. Let me see. Yeah, it, it says that it's empty, like there is nothing in there. 
let, let me see it right now. Okay, they must have been deleted. I don't find one drive on my computer right now. Okay, I'll fix that. I can uh, reinitiate it and uh, we can put it there. Uh, till yesterday it was there. I don't know what happened. I'll fix that. I'll fix that. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay, let me. Should we start with the introduction? First chapter. Yes, please. Okay. Right. As far as PMBOK is concerned, PMBOK is divided into 13 chapters. The first three chapters, rather I would say the first two chapters are about the basic concepts which surround project management. The very first chapter will actually be putting the reference to context in place. It is going to introduce you to all such concepts which surround the project management, which are outside the domain of project management, inside the domain of project management, and it will establish the reference to context of the project management. This is the very first chapter. Second chapter will focus on the project management alone. It will not talk about things around the project management, but it will talk about within the project. So what is the project life cycle and um, how the environment affect the project? So such like things would be in the next chapter. Third chapter is developing the framework for project management body of knowledge. So that from framework is actually going to be helpful for us uh, that framework is going to be helpful in understanding the remaining 10 chapters because it defines the process groups the five process groups which we are aware, are aware uh, as uh, what we call them the domains in the project syllabus the course outline we have the five domains initiation planning execution monitoring and control and close so you will be introduced to these five process groups what are the different processes in each one of those process groups and also each process out of those what are going to be the inputs to those processes what are the tools and techniques you will be using and what are the outputs from each of those processes. There are 47 such processes relating to the project management. <clears throat> so, um, third chapter will establish those processes, process groups and also the specialized knowledge areas under which those processes inhibit. So, Third chapter lays down the groundwork for the remaining 10 chapters. Remaining 10 chapters relate to 10 specialized knowledge areas like integration, scope, time, cost, quality and so on. So each one of them 
would be represented in PMBOK guide as a separate chapter and all the related processes of that knowledge area would be discussed in detail in that chapter. So that's how we'll move ahead. <clears throat> Let me open it up again, just close down. Okay, tell me when you see the screen. Okay. Right. The very first chapter includes, uh, I mean, uh, the whole book is divided into three sections. The first section, as I said, is uh, the project management framework, which is the first two chapters. Second section is the framework itself, where the standard of project management is defined. What are the process groups, what are the knowledge areas, and what are the ingredient processes in each. So it's a brief introduction of all of those. And third section comprises of the 10 chapters or the 10 knowledge areas. And then in addition to that, you have the professional responsibility and the business ethics for the project managers. First chapter has this index right in front of you. First of all, we'll discuss what is the purpose of this PMBOK guide. What is the definition of the project? What is the project management? You know, it might seem that, you know, these are just definitions. They are the, I must ensure you these are not just definitions. These are the concepts and they are actually going to shake you because this is not how you know what project is and what project management is. This is redefined. <clears throat> then there, what are the relationships between amongst these portfolio management, program management, project management? Again, an eye-opener which will actually take you to completely a new world of project management and that is organizational project management. Then relationship of the project management with operations management and the organizational strategy, business value will be discussed, what is the role of the project manager, that would be discussed and this body of knowledge would be briefly touched upon. First of all, the purpose. As I, I was introducing to you, back in 1969 when five people got together in Philadelphia and they formed this project management institute. They actually wanted some guideline to be created and provided for the project managers. Now, how could you provide a guideline to all kinds of project managers? Project managers worldwide have got their own ways of thinking. They have got their cultural limitations. Their industries put certain limitations on them. So there are so many things and it was really very difficult job to have something generally recognized. So this was a journey of finding the commonalities. So the purpose of this standard is basically to identify. You see, the word identify is very important here. We are not supposed to go into the detail of all the practices. PIMBOK is going only to identify all the generally recognized good practices. And they are just listed down in this whole PIMBOK guide. It may explain some things, but not in that very detail. It will just point you into the right direction. And it is up to you to understand that concept. 
in further details. So that is one reason why they say PMBOK is not enough to prepare for the, PM, for the PMP exam. In PMBOK, you might see that there is a concept about SWOT analysis and uh, SWOT analysis is defined in only two lines, two sentences. So is it all you need to know about a SWOT analysis? No. Actually, as a project manager, you must have been doing something like a SWOT analysis. If you are not doing that, you need to learn it from somewhere. PIM, PIMBOK guide is just mentioning that SWOT analysis can be done. Now, how to do it? This is to be tested and this is not given in PMBOK. So the one thing is, it is about the identification of all the generally recognized best practice, good practices, not the best practices. Then we say, why, why we say generally recognized? That is why, because <clears throat> all the practices by all the professions, they may not be common. But there are certain things which have to be common in all kinds of projects, no matter it is a IT project, the construction project, it is a health project, it is an NGO, whatever kinds of project we are doing, there are certain things we will have to be doing in all the cases. So what are those things which are commonly done by all project managers? So this was to be identified. But as I described yesterday, out of those things which we select as commonalities, everything is not right. Some of the practices we have identified that commonly people do might be wrong. So this is the responsibility of the standard to establish what is good and what is wrong, what is bad. So separate the good from the bad and only project the good. So that leaves us with the good practices generally recognized. So this is how we define, identify that subset of project management body of knowledge that is generally recognized as a good practice. Let me talk about the good practice. Why are we talking about good practices? Why are we not talking about best practices? Best practices means that you have already attained some level of excellence. So it is assumed if you are on a journey to good practice, you are following good practices, then it is assumed that you already were good. That means you were following all the good practices, the bare minimum standard you were meeting and you were not in habit of doing any bad practices. Only then you can start talking about competition. You can start talking about the best practices. Standards do not talk about best practices. Standards only talk about good practices. They just segregate good from bad and propagate the good practices. So good practice means that there is a general agreement that the correct application of these skills, tools and techniques can enhance the chances of success over a wide range of different projects. You see, the good practices mentioned in PMBOK, if you very religiously follow all of them, all the skills, all the tools and all the techniques, that does not essentially mean that you will always be successful in the project. But it does mean that it enhances your chances to succeed. But there is no guarantee. It is just a guideline provided to you. Just on the basis of a guideline, you can't claim that you want to sue that PMI for giving you this good practice because that good practice did not apply to your project. It may not apply to your project, but there are many good practices which did apply to your project and you did not give the credit for those to PMI. 
and you are trying to discredit PMI for only those good practices which did not fit in, into your project. Projects are unique. Projects are uncertain. And there is no guarantee whatsoever that if you follow this specific path, you will always succeed. But good practices will show you approximately the right way. So good practices does not mean that the knowledge described should always be applied uniformly on all the projects. You have to vary it. It is the will and wish of the project manager and his team. They have to see what fits them the best. They pick those good practices. All the good practices may not apply to your project. They pick up those specific good practices and use them appropriately as per the requirement of their project. So it is not the PMI which is responsible for choosing those good practices. Project management team is responsible for determining what is appropriate for any given project. I hope you are following me then. Okay, let us be a bit more interactive. Give me a rest and tell me what is the project. Anyone? Dina. Okay, let me let me ask it one by one. Uh, ji, 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 boli. Uh, yeah, sir. Project is a process in which uh, uh, yeah. In in the result, there is some sort of service or uh, like product. Okay. I mean, in simplest words. Right. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll keep your definition there. Anyone who can contribute. Is he right or wrong? Uh, it's achieving some goal by using some specific processes. Processes, okay. Okay, so uh, both of you differ in this. He said it is a process and you say you achieve the goal by using some processes. Yeah, in a sequence like like you told in the introduction, like mm -hmm. um, start of the project, um, like starting and, and then executing it and then ending it. So it's all the process. These are different processes and the and the objective is to reach to achieve a specific target okay if this is a, if this is a process then what is operation do you not have processes and operations mm, of course we have we have in the operations as well then what is the difference between operation and project i think uh, in operation it is a an ongoing process but uh, in the project it's for a fixed time Fixed time. You mean um, I have fixed the time for the project first January to thirty first December. Is it fixed time? Yeah, I think because we have to plan on what our uh, objective is, and based on that we have a timing, right? So we have to schedule okay. it. No, what is more important, uh, the fixed time or the objective? Hello. What is more important? Is it the fixed time or the objective? The objective is uh, impo uh, more important, but uh, we would still have to, I think we would still have to, uh, since we are planning, we need to keep a schedule mm -hmm. because there's resources, cost involved. So all of this, I think we would have to take time into consideration, but obviously the objective is more important. Objective is more important. You see, yeah. when you say uh, fixed time, you know, that, uh, that confuses a bit. Because, as I said, 1st January to 31st December is a time frame. Mm -hmm. Okay, what, what do we need to do? You say 
during this time whatever we do is a project no that is not how the fixed time is defined during this time you have to meet specific objectives and if those objectives cannot be achieved in this time this time can be extended because more important is our project the objective is more important and from where have this objective come who told us this objective and why this could come from our stakeholders from your stakeholders so the stakeholders came directly to tell you their objective the mm -hmm. customer's requirement customer requirement but then uh, my question is who are you why did they come to you uh, i mean what is your position in the organization why are they coming to you like the stakeholders like like just mentioned stakeholders um they are they are asking asking us as a project manager that this is the specific um specific project that you have to implement and we we have to find a project okay you see i have no problem with what you are saying yes there are stakeholders yes there is a project yes there are the requirements but how did this this relationship establish you are a project manager working within an organization and that organization made you the project manager therefore the need must have been felt at the organizational level for this project maybe the stakeholders have come to the organization maybe the organization felt by themselves that some some uh, project has to be initiated but if they did not start this project would would they not survive what is so important about this project it actually goes both ways sometimes um, there's so that sometimes um, stakeholders or the small the initiate the project mm -hmm. um, they must require some specific product and they once they get this need they their marketing team or uh, let's say their marketing team or their sales team they approach to a specific vendor and ask them to okay you provide this service can you can you deliver us this project and this will be the revenue sharing among us then being a part of the vendor from the vendor side mm -hmm. the organization from that side like um, vendors marketing department they will approach to the to the technical department and they will they will agree on specific some parameters and if i am from the technical side or i am from the technical side uh, project manager i'll be asked by my specific higher uh, hierarchy to take okay, you as a project manager you have to deliver this kind of project for this customer mm -hmm. so then i'll be then i'll be following all those steps to deliver a project but but it it, it goes both ways sometimes the the vendor uh, it can be vice versa as well vendor can also want they have they have they have a specific product and they want to sell it to some other uh, other customer so they will their sales team will be approaching to the to the customer and uh, okay. by customer i mean the and they'll be asking them okay we have this specific product you want to so wonderful so that means somewhere somewhere there was a need existing so it all revolves around need you have to there has to exist a business need if there is a business need if there is a business need you will 
then develop a business case around it. And this is happening within my organization because I am a project manager for my organization. My organization have given birth to this project and hired me as a project manager. This all will come later. But before even the project was born, there was a business need. And to fulfill that business need, now from where this business need has come, that might have come from the stakeholder, that might have come from the environment, that might have come from the organizational strategy or whatever. But there was a business need. <clears throat> and there was an opportunity which we could exploit. So we created a business case which justified the business need and it was basically a feasibility which told us that this job can be done. Like you said, if the customer came to us for with a specific product idea and asked us to create that, then we have to look at our organizational strategy, organizational need. <clears throat> Should we make this product or not? You see, somebody is in need of, you know, food for 200 people. That is his, that is his need. He comes to me and he asks me, provide me food for 200 people. And you know what? I am a software company. What do you say? Is there a business need? From your organization level, yes? There, there can be, maybe they're asking, okay, we need food for 200 people. Mm -hmm. They're asking a software company, they can ask them, okay, you can create a software that we can, how we can distribute no, it not, and how we can. They're not asking for a software, they're asking for food. <laughs> <laughs> I am developing software. <laughs> no, then it, it's not related. So, so that is a stakeholder need, but that does not coincide with my organization. That's why I am not interested. There is no business business case around it. It will be rejected. Even if I create, try to create a business case, it will be rejected. It will never germinate into a project. So. For me, for my organization, my organization strategy is prime. My organizational vision is basically what we are following. We have our organizational goals. We have our organizational objectives. And if we are a software company, our objective is to create some software. Right? And if my vision is to be the best company in the country, then probably we want to excel in this area. We don't want to sell food. Therefore, we'll be looking at those stakeholders who would be aligned with our organizational objectives. And only then we, our business needs will be aligned and we will accept any such job. So far, there is no project. So far, this is just the battle of organizational strategy. If something coincides with my organizational strategy, <clears throat> only then my organization will consider that. Only then the business case will be established. And once the business case is established and we agree with that organization or that client to develop that product, that is the time we get into an agreement with that company. So we have a contract or an agreement or an MOU. You need a software to be developed for this purpose. We are the right people to do it. And this is our objective to create these kinds of software. That's why we are bidding for your contract. And we should be selected for that. Many other people would also be bidding for that. <clears throat> Say we are selected. Say this contract is awarded to us. Now this is our project. Now my organization has acquired this project and now this 
project is to be done. So far, project has not started. We have been doing pre-project activities. Now the project has been established and my organization has to assign someone to look after this project from the executive point of view. So maybe some project director is assigned, a very senior person, and he is given the whole responsibility of managing everything in the project at the higher level. He further hires a project manager and assigns him the job, and then the team is mobilized, resources are mobilized, and ultimately we plan how to do it. You see, I just wanted you to come into perspective. We are not doing projects for our customer. We are not doing projects for anyone in the market. We are only doing projects when they also meet our need and requirement. If they do not meet our need and requirement, our organizational need and requirement, then probably we are not interested. We do not want to provide food of 200 people because that's not my job. So I'll only be interested in those jobs which are aligned with my organizational study. So this word organizational strategy is going to be used repeatedly and this is very important for us. Are you with me on that? Yes, sir. Okay. Well. I just have one more question. Sure, sure. So, I mean, now we're, think, now we're thinking from a business perspective, but what about other things like, you know, maybe if there's a project apart from a business scenario where it's a personal project or if it's okay. you know, some other sort of outside of the organization, so how do we consider that? Okay, tell me, tell me a scenario. Your personal project, you want to make a house, construct a house, right? Maybe, yeah, maybe build a home that that would be one one example yeah okay. you want to build a home where do you want to build a home uh back my home country india so is 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 it your business need uh it becomes yeah it's it's yeah, yeah. it's personal need yeah because the, yeah the, because you are you, you are you are dealing you are dealing with your own business it is your mm -hmm. business to live a successful life, a comfortable life is your business. Mm. Got it? So, got it, got it, got it. if you are an individual, this is your business. And you have your specific objectives in life. You have a vision mm. what you want to be, where you want to be. And make, building a house is part of the accomplishment of that vision. Are you with me on that? Understood, understood. Yeah, it makes sense. So you must always be able to relate whatever you are doing to the higher objective, to the higher vision, to the object, uh, to the strategic objective of your organization. No matter that organization is a single person or a huge organization, there is always a vision, a mission, an objective, goals and all that. And all of the setup of an organization, even the operations of an organization, are actually aligned with the organizational strategy. And when we are doing some projects in an organization, they are also aligned with the organizational strategy. We cannot do anything in an organization which is in contradiction to the organizational objectives. So this is first lesson we must learn that whatever we do, we do to satisfy the organizational strategy. Mm. Makes sense. Okay. Now, what is the difference between the project and the operation? You said operations are ongoing. Right. I agree with that. Are the projects not ongoing? Projects are ongoing, but... Uh... The difference is that it might be uh, on a fixed deliverable. For an operation is uh, a long-term process where we keep achieving that, uh, you know, objective or deliverable. But uh, a project could be a short-term deliverable 
which we need to achieve for that particular okay. requirement. Right, right. Um, let me put it that way. Operations is something we we are in habit of doing. Right. I come to my office daily at a specific time and leave at a specific time. I have certain duties to perform in my office and they are earmarked somewhere. I always do those duties on a daily, as a daily routine. I am in habit of doing those jobs. I have good practice in doing those jobs. And therefore, this, is, this has become my second nature. I seldom go wrong in those things because I have a lot of practice in these things. Although there are some uncertainties and some risks in my operational work sometimes, but it is only sometimes because most of the time I am very confident what to do and how to do. Now looking at this definition, what are projects? Are you, are you that much certain in your projects as you are for in your operations? Are you sure what you're doing? Yeah? No, we are not. No. Okay. We are not. And why are we not sure? Because we are doing something we have never done before. We are taking up a challenge. We are doing a new thing. And because we are doing a new thing, which we have no experience doing earlier, so we are afraid of doing it. We don't know what are the exact steps to be taken. But as an experienced project manager, I consult my experience and I look back and see how, how challenging works I have attempted and what are the lessons learned from them. And to the best of my knowledge, I try to conceive and plan this project, which is surrounded in a lot of uncertainty. You see, I'm afraid of projects. I'm not afraid of operations. Operations is my second nature. Project is something virgin ground. I have never entered this area before. And secondly, this is a challenge which I will accomplish for a specific purpose and when that purpose is achieved, the purpose of the project is done, is no more. So when I deliver the product of the project, when I meet the objective or goals of my project and I prove that this can be done and this has been done, then there is no more need for a project anymore. Are you with me on that? I want someone to challenge me. I am using some words you have never done before. You are doing something you have never done before. Anybody wants to challenge me. Uh, I was just thinking, I mean, uh, a project could be that we've done it before, but then you said that, you know, that uh, experienced project manager, he has the resource of his experience. So it could be that maybe, uh, if, for example, if you're building uh, a house, yes. maybe a project manager could have built homes earlier, but it could be something new. Exactly. But his ex experience helps him out. You might have built many houses, but you did not build this house before. Exactly. So this this is a project and this might give you new challenges. Maybe the ground on which this house is to be built is completely of a different nature and you know you have never faced that situation before. Maybe the weather in this place where you are building this house is completely different from the place you have built earlier and therefore you have to 
resort to different means. So we are always treading into unknown virgin territory. This is the special. It can be a replica. May it be the replica? May it be the replica? Yep. But this is not the same project. Yes. The situation has changed. The environment has changed. The, the, the um, uh, source of funding has changed. So there are so many uncertainties attached with it. So project is surrounded in uncertainty. And project has a certain purpose to meet. And that specific purpose, if met, it will deliver something. And that thing it delivers is my product. And that product, if delivered according to the requirements and handed over to whomsoever is my customer, the purpose of my project is solved, is done, and there is no need for this project to exist anymore. Whereas operations do not cease, they continue forever. They may change, but they continue forever. Okay. If you, you have understood this much, should I show you the definition? Are you ready for that? Um, just one just one point about the operations. Okay. Um, but in the operation, they can, there is a big possibility like um, every time you are facing a new challenge. Exactly. Like, that you are facing is a different one. Mm -hmm. So that can, that, and also for the operation, if we look at in this way, is it in a project when you are starting and, and executing and ending, it's not a live product. It's a project which is not, not containing any, let's say in the case of, an, of a house, mm -hmm. at, at, in the project phase, there's nobody living there. Mm -hmm. So if you mess up, you can, you can fix it. Mm -hmm. because there's no one living at that time but in the operation case um, if the whole family is living there and then something goes wrong or let's say a wall get, gets a crack right. then it will be a more difficult thing to fix oh. it because the whole family is living there and all the stuff is inside so Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, make, make it make operation a more challenging thing yeah. than the project and, and in operation uh, by challenging I mean in the operation you get you get all the new cases most of the time okay anything can happen very good very good you know this is exactly uh, what I wanted you to start thinking now you see uh, coming back to the same question why did you build this house because of the need because of uh, right. because of the way when, when this said. house is built what will you do with it of course you will live in it Okay, so as soon as the house is built, the project is complete and now the product is handed over to the operations and now you start using it, you start operating it. I have given you a deliverable, you are now in operations. And when the project was designed, naturally your requirements were taken and to the best of our knowledge, we d designed this house as to the comfort and needs of the people who would be living here. And now, once the project is complete, we are living in that house. We are now in operations. Now, while we are in operations, we, you know, cook in that kitchen and we live in that house and all that, you know, whatever regular activities are to be done. And suddenly you find out that there is a crack in the, in the wall. So, this is a problem. This is an issue. And my normal living habits does not describe how to, you know, uh, face this challenge. This is not in my SOP. My standard operating procedure of living in the house does not describe what if a crack appears. So this is a challenge. So whenever there is a challenge, my organizational you know the, uh, okay let me uh, put it this way whenever there is a challenge or there is an issue there is a problem the problem we will try to resolve so if there is a crack 
what can you do this is not in your operating manual this is not in uh, in the in the responsibilities of people who are living in this house so they will escalate the issue to the higher management right maybe the owner maybe whomsoever has constructed it and we can escalate this issue to him and see ask him why this has happened so he will try to troubleshoot that and if it can be fixed according to some operating procedure he will fix it otherwise there is a need to change maybe this wall has to be broken down from there and rebuilt that portion this could be a need for an other whenever there is a change there may be a need for a fresh project so putting something right in your operations could be a new project did i make some sense out of it yeah okay so actually operation is a bigger thing and projects come and go within an organizational operations and on the, on the uh, on the need basis if there is a business need you will start creating a project you will achieve certain targets merge the result of the project or the deliverable of the project into operations train your people to use that new thing and they start using it then again they will face another scenario and that would require another change and that change will give birth to yet another project and that way we will continuously improve okay this is the definition as per project management body of knowledge <clears throat> now after we have discussed all this i hope that this is going to be a very easy definition for you because we have talked about everything already project is a temporary endeavor can you relate it it is a temporary endeavor this is not something permanent this is not something you will keep doing forever if you have to fix a wall then this is a temporary endeavor it will take some fixed time i don't say that you define the time first but whatever time it will take it would be you know temporary time and we will try to fix it so this is we don't exactly know how to fix it but we will endeavor to do it we'll try our level best to do it and why, what are we trying to do it is to undertake to create a unique product service result this is a challenging situation which have, we have never faced before we are creating something new and unique and that thing which is going to come out ultimately could be a product or a service or a result which can we can generally call as a deliverable it could be a tangible product it could be a service you know um, i am providing you this training i am providing you a service at the end of the day you can't say that what have you delivered you didn't give me any book but i have delivered a service to you so this specific thing uh, training you guys for these few days is a temporary endeavor and you are specific clients to me i have to create this knowledge base in your minds and you will be my unique products so project is a temporary endeavor so you understand when i say temporary endeavor it encompasses two things three things temporary it will start music temporary does not mean that it will start on 1st january and end on 31st december no fixed dates no fixed dates temporary means it will start sometime and must finish sometime we will assign the start and finish date later but whatever we are trying to do it has to start at some point in time and it has to finish at some point in time whereas operations do not have a start and end date they do not start at some time 
point in time and they not, do not finish at some point in time. They are cyclic in nature. <clears throat> so the project I'm trying to do is to start at some point and finish at some point. And whatever I'm trying to do, I'm not really certain about it. So I'm endeavoring to do it. I'm not sure if I would be able to achieve the results or not, but I'm doing my best. And as a result, I would be able to create some unique results, some product, some service or result. Ji, are you okay with the definition? Yes. Next few slides are actually explanation of the same concept. Temporary nature of the project indicates a definite beginning and end. Definite beginning and end does not mean a specific date. But as I said, every project must start at some point in time and finish at some point in time. Those points in time could be allocated dates later when we plan. End is reached when the project objectives are achieved. Project is terminated because its objectives will not or cannot be achieved. Because we were, we were endeavoring to do it, maybe we find that this project is undoable. It cannot be done. We have started it, but it cannot be finished. So we can terminate the project when we realize that it cannot be done. The need for the project no longer exists. Then maybe, you know, the strategic need, the business need uh, around which we tailored this project is no more there. Now why are we doing this project? This is no more of any use to the organization. When we started it, it was of a lot of use. But now organization doesn't want it. So there is no need to have this project anymore. So we can have the product or service or result which I hope you understand product can be something tangible service could be some business function or some service you provide to increase a capability you say we want to enhance the speed of our work of our operational work we want to enhance the speed of our operational work we want to enhance the capability of our people <clears throat> these could be the objectives of the project or it could even be a result maybe uh, creating a feasibility study is the objective of the project. So the result is the feasibility, which is the report, which is a document. So projects could, could be products, uh, could be producing a product, service or result. So anything, you, now you could very easily assess what a project could be. The examples could be developing a new product or service, uh, affecting a change in the structure, staffing, or style of an organization, developing or acquiring a new or modified information system, constructing a building or infrastructure, implementing a new business process or procedure. These all are examples of various kinds of projects. Now, coming back to you, what do you think project management is? Yes. Your opinions, sir. To do a project as like efficiently as it could be. Okay. Good. In a, in a proper way. In a in a better way. In a better way. You mean efficiency and effectiveness and all that. Optimal. Yes. Sir. Right. Anyone else? Yeah, project management is uh, basically before uh, moving into the, uh, uh, the project, we would have to sit and plan on how we would execute it, Okay. how we would uh, schedule it, so, you know, how we would have different milestones, so we could basically track it okay. uh, till that final objective is achieved. Okay. Very nice. So we need to elaborately plan the project and it is not only the planning but a lot many other things to do. Even uh, you mentioned tracking. So the process of tracking itself is a very complicated process and that is part of the project management. 
But let us see what PM BOK has to say about it. Now look at this. Each word has to be read very carefully here. It says application of knowledge, skills, tools and techniques. Let's stop here. Let us see knowledge, skills, tools and techniques. What are these things? Knowledge, skills, tools and techniques. Any profession you are in, you need to acquire knowledge of that profession. You are a civil engineer, you have to have the knowledge of civil engineering. Maybe you are a diploma holder or you are a degree holder. This ensures that you have necessary knowledge required to practice. Right? Once you have necessary knowledge, then you get into the field and you start practicing it. As you practice, more confident you are about your work. Do you remember the very first day you went to your job? How much confident were you? But now, when you have got seven or eight years of work, you have accomplished, a lot many things have made you confident. You have got skills. You know, I did my engineering and I did not know what I will be doing in the field. We were taught everything. You know, I was a civil engineer. We were taught even electricity. We were taught hydraulics. We were taught mechanics. Everything which was not even related to me as I thought at that time. Later on, some of us went to road construction. Some of us went to the hydraulics jobs like, you know, dealing with water and you know everybody acquired a different set of skills although we did study everything together but the skills you acquire they might be different and after many years when you look back you find someone has become specialist of one thing and another person has become specialist of something else so this is the skills he has expired and <clears throat> To practice those skills, you need to have certain tools and techniques available with you. You see, a carpenter needs to have his tools available with him. Otherwise, no matter how much knowledgeable he is, how much skillful he is, he can't make a table because he doesn't have his tools. You can't tell him that because you have this much training and this much skill and um, experience so you should be able to make a table without tools you can't say that so he needs to have his tools available with him and the interesting part is even if you have tools and you do not know the technique to use those tools those tools are useless there is a carpenter who has an education of six months in the skill in the art of carpentry he has eight years experience making tables he has got his own tools and he has developed some techniques with those tools i call him to make a table he tells me he doesn't have the tools he needs to make the table i tell him I have got a set of tools with me. You can use that and make my table. If you are that carpenter, are you okay with it? Are you comfortable? Yes, please. Yeah, I mean, uh, to make a table, there will be a set of required tools. So, I mean, if those tools match what I would require, I think yes, I'll be able to make that table. Okay. Uh, but um, what will you prefer, your own tools or these tools? I would prefer my own tools. Of course, of course. That is the point. And why do you prefer your own tools? Because you are in the habit of using them. You have certain exactly. 
Nick established to use every tool. You are using saw, and when when you are using your saw, your saw has you know adjusted to your hand in a way that at a specific angle, if you cut, it cuts most efficiently. Have you ever used a new saw? Right, uh, you brought a new saw from the market and try to cut a wood with it. What happens? It might not cut as easily as. Of course, because it is fresh and it is not adjusted to your hand. And now you will have to, you know, find the right angle to cut. And after that, mm. that saw would be, you know, known to your hand, and it will always be you know, effectively using it. But if I give you my tools, you might not know the technique to use it most optimally. And to make the things a bit more complex, let's say the technique, the tools I have given him is an electric saw. This carpenter has never used electric saw. He doesn't even know that this can be switched on or off. He doesn't know the technique. How can he use it? So as a project manager, as a project manager, I need to have the project management knowledge, project management experience or skills, project management tools, and project management techniques. Let me start from the beginning. <clears throat> How many of us have the requisite project management knowledge? Just yesterday, we were talking and most of you said that we have no training in project management. But we all claim to be project managers. We are working on projects, but we have not been provided a formal training in project management so far. Do you agree with that? Do you know? Even engineers, even engineers, they do not, they, they are always the project manager on their projects, but they have never been given any training on project management during their degree. So that, that is a misfortune. We first need to have the knowledge and only then we can have skills or practice. What are you practicing if you don't know the knowledge? If you don't know right from wrong, if you don't know what to use where, how can you call yourself a project manager at all? And what kind of skills and practice and experience you are claim, claiming to have as a project manager if you do not have the project management knowledge as such? That is the dilemma. Everybody out of us calls himself a project manager. We do not have the project management knowledge, but we have experience of 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. I do not say that a person without knowledge cannot be successful as a project manager. He may be, but then, okay, tell me if you, you, if you are an engineer, if you were not an engineer and you were supposed to do um, you know, same jobs which you are supposed to be doing now. How would you do it? By hit and try. And sometimes you will succeed and sometimes you will not. But the benefit of having knowledge is that you know all the various ways of doing things and you can always consult back your books and your knowledge and say, okay, for this kind of job, I will use that approach. This is the benefit of knowledge. The person without the knowledge can still do it, but by hit and try. He'll do it wrong and then he will suffer some loss. Then he will again try another method. Again, he will uh, face some loss and ultimately maybe he succeeds one day. So he will have to learn hard way. Although it is, it is his experience, but this is Maybe he did, he get this experience after five years, whereas the person who has a three years degree can do it in three, three months. 
this is the difference between knowledge and skills so without knowledge skills might be difficult with knowledge skill achieving skills is quite easy only you must be oriented towards it <clears throat> then what are the tools and techniques of project management very interestingly we don't know we don't oh we do the project management and we don't know what are the tools and techniques of the project management and some of the tools we may we may identify normally when i ask someone what is name some of the tools of the project management you know what do they reply ms project primavera okay fine these are software but these are not the tools these are actually combination of many tools there is a scheduling tool built into it there is a resource pool tool built into it there is a calendar tool built into it there are lot many tools which are put together into this software but actually a project manager uses a lot many tools and those tools and those techniques he needs to know now if you are a good project manager and you have knowledge of project management you have been skilled in application of that knowledge and you have been using certain tools and techniques which you are you know um, you are good at these are the four things you require where do you want to require that is a question now let's come back to the project we are trying to do build a house so all the work involved in building the house all the project activities which we need to do to meet the requirements of the project means to build the house all the work involved in building the house i will have to apply my project management knowledge skills tools and techniques only to that work <clears throat> remember i cannot apply this knowledge to anything which is not a project if i am applying this knowledge to those activities which are not project activities then this is i am doing something out of scope of the project so basically the mere definition of project management tells us that it is to deal with in scope work of the project in scope work of the project anything which is out of scope should not be done because if i do anything which is out of scope the cost incurred on that the resources spent on that would be extra burden on the project so i should only be spending money on the work which is contributing towards the project requirements or the objectives of the project if something is not contributing towards the ultimate deliverable that activity should not be part of the project and i should not be applying my knowledge skills tools and techniques on that g did you understand that okay um i think we are already over time so i will like to close here and we can continue tomorrow if there are any questions please tell me because uh, there was a little interaction today but i want more interaction any comments sir i guess sir it, it's uh, good enough very nice very nice okay gentlemen thank you very much for your company and let's see you tomorrow thank you sir thank you thank, thank you sir good thank you thank you